We brought a civil rights lawsuit on behalf of the family of Luke Stewart, alleging that his death was the result of the use of excessive force by the officers who killed him, um, which stemmed from an illegal stop and seizure of him in the first place when he was asleep in the car. So that was the basis of the case. We also brought uh, what is called a Monell claim. So we allege that Luke's death resulted from a policy or practice within the Euclid Police Department, something broader, a culture and policy within the police department that was the moving force behind the events that led to his death in the morning of March 13th, 2017. What was illegal about the, um, the stop since he was asleep? Like what? Sure, so basically Luke was not committing any crimes when the officers approached him. He was asleep in his car. His car was not illegally parked. In fact, he had um, plans to sleep at a friend's house and it didn't work out and he slept in the car instead. It was in the early morning hours and an off a neighbor recognized an unfamiliar car and called the police officers. Um, but when the cops arrived, when Officer Catalani specifically arrived, Luke was just sleeping in the car. There's nothing illegal about sleeping in the car. He, it was not illegally parked. There was no indication that there were any warrants for his arrest. There was really no reason to approach him at all, specifically not to approach him in such an aggressive way. The officers, Officer Catalani called Officer Rhodes to the scene. Um, and when he called Officer Rhodes to the scene, he said, we're going to have to pull this guy out of the car. So already before Rhodes even got to the scene, before Luke ever woke up, Catalani had made the decision and Rhodes understood that Catal Catalani meant that they were going to have to physically remove Luke from the car. There's no basis for that. There's no reason for that. He wasn't doing anything wrong. So when the officers got there, um, they shined their bright lights onto Luke's car. Now it's, it's dark. Luke was sleeping. The officers acknowledged that their actions would have startled him when they woke him up and caused him confusion. They didn't announce themselves as police officers. All that Catalani did was knock on the window and wave, and then Luke woke up, and Catalani immediately opened the door and started to try to pull Luke out of the car. He reached for his, Luke's hand with his left hand, and then he reached around Luke's neck with his right arm and, and um, put him in a mandibular lock and tried to pull him out of the car. At the same time, Officer Rhodes got in the passenger side seat of the car, put himself inside the car with his knees on the passenger seat and started to push Luke out of the car. So they were doing a push-pull thing to try to remove him from the car. Again, Luke had not committed any crime. There was no reason for any of this interaction, particularly not any kind of use of force on him in that moment when he had just woken up. They never announced themselves as police officers. There were no red and blue lights on the cars. They had their takedown lights on, so they were blinding lights shining in Luke's face and men attacking him from both sides of the car as soon as he woke up. Interestingly, both of the officers failed to turn on their dash cams, so there's no video of this. They are required by their policy to turn on dash cams. Catalani claims he forgot. Rhodes actually considered turning it on and decided not to. Rhodes's car was directly in front of Luke's car, so had he followed the policy of the police department and turned on his dash cam, we would have video of this. But he didn't. He decided not to turn it on. And that is actually something that was noted by the police department, that there was a failure to comply with that policy, but there was no discipline even for that. In the moment, they did not announce themselves as police officers, and those blinding lights, both of the officers testified that those lights would have been blinding to Luke when he first woke up. So there is no indication that Luke knew that he was dealing with police officers, right? He never acknowledged it, and neither did the police officers know that they were, or you know, claim their office as police officers. This is an issue with um, the city of Euclid also, which was exposed in the Lamar Wright case, another case where Euclid police officers approached the vehicle in a very aggressive way, did not announce themselves as police officers, just came up on both sides in that case with um, guns drawn for no reason. There was no indication again of any, you know, there was no need for a show of force in that way. And again, both opened doors to Lamar Wright's vehicle and tried to pull him out. So clearly this is a problem within the, the city of Euclid and the officers are not being trained appropriately or disciplined appropriately for using that kind of unnecessary and unjustified force. 
So when Luke woke up, he immediately went to turn on his car to drive away, presumably because he didn't know who these people were who were jumping into his car and attacking him when he just woke up. He started to pull away while uh, Catalani was at his driver's side and, Luke, and Rhodes was inside the vehicle with him. Catalani disengaged. Rather than disengage, Rhodes put himself further into the vehicle and was in the car as Luke drove down the street. At this point, the only story that we have about what happened is from Rhodes because he wasn't wearing a body camera. There's no footage available and he killed the only witness to his use of force. But according to Rhodes, he and Luke continued to drive and say something like, what are you doing in my car, man? Rhodes punched Luke. He then tased Luke. And then he struck Luke with the butt of his taser while Luke was driving down the street. At one point, Luke stopped the car at the intersection. For 10 to 15 seconds, he stopped. Rhodes did not get out of the car. Instead of getting out of the car, when he had the opportunity to do so, he continued to try to grab the keys out of the car. And you really have to ask yourself, why? What was so important about stopping this man? They could have taken his license plate. They could have put out a notice for him. He they were a half block away from the police department. Could have called for backup, which no one did. Neither of them did. Instead of getting out of the car, he continued to engage Luke. Luke continued then to drive forward. And eventually, a very short time later, uh, Rhodes shot Luke multiple times and killed him. The Yuko Police Department has been shown to have um, a complete disregard for the people who they police, to have a disregard for, frankly, constitutional and legal policing, and that they treat the use of force as a laughing matter. The appellate court just issued a scathing decision uh, recognizing all of these things from the police department, the, the fact that the chief of police has never once found any civilian complaint against any officer to have any merit is ludicrous. The officer, the sergeant, Sergeant Morawski, who is in charge of reviewing uses of force, testified that he has never reviewed a use of force within the department that he found to be problematic. Once again, ludicrous. There's no real review of any use of force within that department. And without any kind of real review and discipline re and retraining of officers when it's necessary, the code of silence is, is strong. And the use of illegal force runs rampant within that, that department. And there's no reason why any officer should stop because they get away with it. And the department condones it. The department has ratified it. And it will continue until there is a real recognition within the department that their officers have a problem. There, I have found in my review of their cases that there is a real difference in the way they police and use force against people of color, particularly black people in the city of Euclid. That is, is proven by the numbers. They have no real way to track officer use of force. They don't track officer discipline in, well, there is really no officer discipline to track, but none of this is taken seriously. And, and you know, again, look back at this defensive tactics training, which um, the chief attended and found to be appropriate. And he then testified in multiple cases that um, it was dark humor. To use a Chris Rock skit about ble police beating up black people was dark humor. When I pushed him on how he communicated to his officers that it was just a joke, he had no response. He just knows that his guys will know it's a joke. Why is there room for a joke in that environment anyway? There is no room for a joke about racist, violent policing. It is not appropriate to joke about it. It should be taken more seriously than anything else in the department because when the officers go out on the streets and wield the power of the state, we need to expect we have the highest requirements from them, right? That is when the constitutional protections on people are most important. There is no room for joking. And this department is only joking about it. And they have never taken any step to, to ensure that their officers know how serious the use of force is at all. And even to this day, I don't believe that they've done that. 
even with all of the attention on this, that they were, ex you know, their training has been exposed. And I have deposed the chief since we exposed that training. And at last time I spoke to him, there had been nothing done within the department to ensure that the officers knew that that, that excessive force would not be tolerated by the department that racism would not be tolerated by the department. They've taken no steps. It's not that big of a department. There needs to be a cultural shift within that entire department so that the officers know that this kind of violent, unconstitutional policing will no longer be tolerated. And I have yet to see that Euclid has taken this seriously. I mean, I, I think what's so significant about the Lamar Wright ruling is that um, they, the court recognized how problematic the, the department on a whole is. The Monell theory is a difficult theory. It's a difficult claim to make to prove that a, a constitutional violation, a use of force, is the result of a customer practice is a big leap in the legal world. And so for a, the Sixth Circuit and a fairly conservative panel on the Sixth Circuit to recognize that this department is so infused with, with inappropriate training, lack of discipline, lack of supervision, just across the board problems. I don't believe that there's any way for us to then look at the Luke Stewart case in a vacuum, right? This is the department that caused that violation as well. These are the, that is the department that trained these officers to conduct themselves in ways that are not appropriate and that need to be called into question. That's what's significant about the Lamar Wright decision. What the Lamar Wright decision stands for is that a jury needs to be presented this information about the department and a jury needs to decide whether it's okay. In police cases, so often juries don't get the information because the protections for police officers are so significant. And we see that in Luke Stewart's case, right? It is our job as lawyers to try to develop a question of fact, to prove to the court that there's some reason why a jury has to decide these cases. To, but we are confronted with qualified immunity. And qualified immunity is so strong to protect police officers, to, to take away police misconduct victims day in court. That's what happens. So rather than Luke Stewart's family being able to present what happened to a jury of their peers, so a jury gets to decide as neutral fact finders whether what Rhodes and Catalani did was appropriate. That is strip, they're, 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 that opportunity is taken from them. And instead, the case was dismissed without a jury, just based on a legal issue because the police are protected by qualified immunity. The Sixth Circuit in Lamar Wright said no. It's not okay for Lamar Wright to be for Lamar Wright's case to be kicked out of court without an opportunity to go to a jury, the police officers do not get to be shielded by qualified immunity in this case, given the fact that there is a real question about what happened to him and whether his rights under the Constitution were violated and whether those rights under the Constitution were violated because the city of Euclid has such significantly uh, problematic policies, practice, practices, and customs, right? So that is the, what we're asking for for Luke Stewart and why we've appealed this case, because Luke's family deserves their day in court. They deserve to be able to present this set of facts to a jury. And it's important not just for Luke and Luke's family. It's also important for everyone else who crosses through Euclid, the city of Euclid, because that department continues since that day, since before they killed Luke Stewart, and they have continued to do so after they've have shown that they have a disregard for the rights of the people of Euclid and anyone who crosses through, and it's not okay. The police officers cannot continue to hide behind qualified immunity and not be held to take some responsibility for their actions. They can't hide in, in, the, in the dark anymore and keep this stuff out of the public, and that's what we're hoping for for Luke and what we've asked the appellate court to do, to send this case back to the trial court so that we can put this case in front of a jury to seek justice for Luke.